I responded, if he does, I'm having him for supper. So, <laughs> Stephen, grab it for supper. <laughs> and another praise report. Not too bad. Too bad. Good morning, all. Um, I just got a praise report in. My car got broken in just last week, and um, I, woke, I got woken up in the middle of the night, and something said that your car is getting broken in, but I ignored it and kind of said a little prayer. Went back to sleep and I got up, went into the car, and everything was all over the place and everything. I had about seven hundred dollars worth of stuff in my car. And that thing was taken. Praise the Lord. Yes. Does God not protect his own people? Yes. 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 Good morning. Happy Easter, everyone. Happy Easter. First of all, I want to give uh, God all the praise. Thank you, Jesus. Um, the reason why I'm saying this is because I want to thank God for giving me a job that I never expected, never done before. And uh, it took a man who just noticed the way I was working, and right now I'm working side by side with him. Um, I used to be doing all kinds of uh, other jobs like flagging and uh, painting and stuff, but I guess God <laughs> just somehow chose this job for me. It's floor and I do floor tiles and carpets and stuff. And I, um, you know, as much as I hate to say this, but uh, I have to, uh, I have to um, thank God for being patient with, with, with me, even though I've been very angry with him for the last year or so. But um, it's not only just that I've been angry with him, I've been angry with myself, and God has shown me that. But I still want to give him praise because he's revealing the type of person I am and stuff. But I still want to give him thanks for the fact that he gave me this job that I never expected. And if he's real, man, I, I can't do without him. So. When we're not, when it's people are watching us and we don't realize. It's not about performing being a Christian when eyes are on us. It's who we are when we think no one is watching. Amen. God is good all the time. And all the time. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Yeah. 
Ready, Dennis. Hold that testimony, brother. You turn it down a little now. Thank you. Okay, Father God, we thank you for your message this morning, the message of the Easter angel. Lord, you've always got something to tell us and show us, always got something to reveal to us, Lord, about yourself, and how to encourage us and strengthen us, Lord, and empower us, Lord, to be better children of God. But when the angel came on that sunrise morning, Tell the people all about you and where you were. You weren't in the grave. What a day it was and what a powerful day it was. And so, Lord, as we go back over the story again, as we enter in, Lord, with the people on that great morning, Father God, give us some food today, Lord, to take home. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene married the mother of James in Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning on that first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen, and they said amongst themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You see Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him, as he said to you. So they went out quickly, and they fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, <laughs> for they were afraid, for they were afraid. How would you feel if you were encountering an angel? And he was telling you some glorious information. Would you not be a little bit afraid? Oh, sure. A little bit frightened? Oh, yes. Through the Bible, throughout the Bible, God uses angels to make special announcements to humans. For instance, he used an angel to send a message of destruction to Lot in Sodom. And that's found in Genesis 19. He came to announce the birth of Samson, Judges 13. He came to announce the birth of John the Baptist in Luke 1. He announced the conception of Christ in Luke 1 and 11. And he announced the birth of Christ in Luke 2, 18 to 14. So it seems that when God has an announcement of extreme importance, he often sends the message through an angel. From the reading the Bible, it kind of makes you wonder if angels ever get a day off. In our text, we are presented with an angel that made an announcement that still echoes throughout time in the universe almost 2,000 years later. It is this special message that the Easter angel that I want us to consider this morning. On that first Easter morning, as dawn was breaking on a world that was forever changed, a special angel delivered a message, a message that is still vital today. Fear and dread filled the hearts of this little band of women as they made their way through the still dark streets of Jerusalem early that Sunday morning. They were going to the tomb of the man they had all believed to be the Messiah. The man for whom they had left all, everything, behind. They were going to the tomb of a man who had promised life to all who came unto him. But who was now himself dead. Certainly there was confused, confusion and, and they were confounded as they came near the tomb. They were also concerned about the huge stone that covered the door into the tomb. How would they ever gain access to that body? How could these three women ever hope to move a stone that weighed several hundred pounds? Yet they proceeded, carried along by their tender mission, that of finishing the preparations for the burial of the body of Christ. And as they came within sight of the tomb, they were astounded to see that stone was rolled away. 
And the Roman guards lying like dead men, all around the mouth of the tomb. Seeing this, they ran to the tomb and they looked in, only to find that the body of Jesus was gone. What fear must have gripped the hearts of these three women? Perhaps they feared that the Jewish rulers or the Romans had taken the body to prevent his disciples from faking his resurrection. They were fearful and they couldn't understand what had happened to Jesus. Maybe they suspected that grave robbers had taken the body and would use it in some extortion plot. Whatever the doubts and concerns that may have filled their hearts, they were short-lived. Because suddenly the women noticed a young man sitting upon the stone in Matthew 28, 2 and 3. This angel sees their fear and begins to speak to them. And in so doing, he delivers a message of hope that still has the power to change lives this morning. Let's listen and hear for ourselves the message of the Easter angel. It is a message of peace. Be not afraid. The fear of these ladies must have felt upon seeing the angel, but what grace that the first words from his mouth are words of peace. Yet this is how the Lord always deals with his people. For the Spirit of God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power and love and self-discipline. Amen? Amen? It is very appropriate. And it is an appropriation that his resurrection should be attended with a message of peace. Because after 2,000 years, his resurrection from the dead is still bringing that same message of peace to the hearts of all who believe in him. Amen? So notice just a few of the area of life where his resurrection gives peace. Number one, salvation in Hebrews 7.25. Therefore he is able to save completely those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to him or come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Number two, death. John 11, 25 to 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And, whatever, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And number three, eternity. John 14, 1 to 3. John saw a glimpse of the glorified Christ, and he is doing well in Revelation 1, 13 to 18. He is alive and he's waiting on his children to come home. And among the lampstands was one, was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire, his feet like bronze glowing in the furnace, and his voice like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. Coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like sun shining in all of its brilliance. And when I saw him, John said he fell to his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Number four, life itself, John 14, 16 to 18. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I do not know about you, Eagle's Vision, but those things give me true peace of mind and peace of heart. It's not only a message of peace, but it's also a message of power. He is risen. The grave could not hold him. Satan could not hold him. Men could not hold him. Lies could not hold him. He rose again. Jesus wasn't the first man to get up from the dead. No. Lazarus, John 11, 
the widow of name, the son, her son, Luke 7, Jairus' daughter, Mark 5. But he was the first to ever get up to die no more. Amen? Amen. All the others were just resuscitations. Jesus accomplished a true resurrection that morning. Because he was able to conquer death, all those who received him as their personal Savior became partakers of that same resurrection power. At that very point of salvation, his resurrection is imputed to us. And we become alive in him in Romans 6 and 8. Now if he be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Amen? Amen. 2 Timothy 2.11, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. And this is that abundant life which Jesus spoke of in John 10 and 10. The thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Amen and praise his name. Amen. All this great resurrection power will be ultimately realized when Jesus returns and raises Christ from and Christ in sorry, raises the dead in Christ. So imagine all those departed saints, resurrected from the dead and glorified to live forever with Jesus forevermore. In Thessalonians 4, 3 to 13 to 18, it tells us, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and he rose again. And so we believe that God will bring Jesus, those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who still are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shout, a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Oh my goodness! I'm looking forward to that day. And so we will be with the Lord forever, church. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. He is coming again. What a day that will be, just doesn't seem to do it justice, does it? If God's people would take the time to look around them and see what the Lord has done in saving the lost and changing the lives of the redeemed. It becomes plain that the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus is active all around us today. Every redeemed sinner is a testimony to the life-changing, life-giving power of the risen Christ. And after all, a dead man doesn't have the power to change anyone. Amen? But a living Lord who works miracles in any wreck and ruined life. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new is here. Don't you feel new? A new creation in Christ. All that junk, all that Sin, gone. And Christ doesn't remember it anymore. He chooses not to continue to bring it up. Not only is it the message of peace and power, church, it is also a message of potential. He is not here. And after Jesus rose from the dead, he immediately disappears and appears to be busy doing something important. His appearance to Mary Magdalene. Jesus forbids Mary from touching him that morning because he was on his way to the Father. As the great high priest, Jesus would be the one required to make the sin offering of the blood upon the mercy seat that would atone for the sins of the world. And it seems that that is what Jesus was doing that morning in his absence from the tomb. Hebrews 9, 6-14 tells us this. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry their ministry. But only 
Only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this time that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and the sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink, and various ceremonial washings, external regulations, applying until the time of the new order. But when Jesus came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and the more perfect tabernacle. Now that is not made with human hands. No, 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 no. That is to say it is not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves. But he entered by the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and ashes of heifers sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctified them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, Cleanse our consciences from the acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. That's what he did for us. The great praise that must have filled the heaven when Jesus placed his blood upon the mercy seat that morning. This work of the risen Lord is forever finished. He said it is finished. However, do not think for a minute that Jesus is not busy this morning. He is still alive, and he is still acting yes. on our behalf. Yes. He is acting as our intercessor right now as we sit here. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. Therefore, he is able to save completely, completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Amen. Romans 8, 34 says, Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that he was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. He's watching over us always in Hebrews 4, 13. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Oh, that we would remember that. That nothing is hidden in God's sight. Everything is uncovered and is all laid bare before the eyes of him whom we must give an account. So whatever we may think we're getting off with something, no, we're not. God is recording everything. He feels our pain. Hebrews 4.15 For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So whatever you're feeling sometimes of going through and you're walking with your head down, you're feeling discouraged, depressed, unloved, unwanted, just remember Jesus walked that same walk that you're walking. He went through it all. And he knows how to help us through those times. He feels our pain. He is more concerned about our, fa our affairs than we are. He stood up when Stephen was stoned. The needs of God's people literally move heaven. When Stephen was stoned, Jesus was there, right there in the midst of it all. When you are going through hardship, he's right there with you. He's acting as our advocate in 1 John 2 and 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Who would want to reject a Savior like that? He's gone to prepare a place for us. John 14, 1 to 3. 
Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, he said, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. And if that were not so, I would have told you that. That I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Waiting for the Father to send him after his children. Hebrews 10 and 13 says, Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made a footstool for his feet. Jesus shares the common trait with every other living thing this morning. He is active, but he is activity is all for the benefit of his people. Not only is it a message of peace and power and potential this morning, it is also a message of promise. Ye shall see him. The angel closed his message to these women by reminding them of the Lord's promise. They would see him again. This word from the Lord must have lifted their hearts. They had come to the tomb that morning expecting to see a dead body. They left it with the promise that they would look upon his living face. Can you imagine their excitement? Saints of God this morning, they don't have a thing on us, do they? We may not be able to see the risen Lord there in Galilee, but we have a promise that may be just a bit better. You see, we too shall see his face. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Not in Galilee, but in glory. In fact, we will see him first of all in the clouds above the earth. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 tells us, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shout of command and the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we, we, who are still alive and are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds, and we will meet him in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Forever, that word forever, Lamar, forever. We will be with him forever. Then we will see him returning in glory in Revelation 11 to 16. John said, I saw the heaven standing open, and there before me a white horse, whose rider is called faithful and true. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. His name, he has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Can you just experience it this morning? That one day the King of Kings and Lord of Lords will be amongst us. Then we will see him ruling this earth as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Then we will see his face forever in all glory in heaven above. And I don't know about you this morning, but Jesus will be heaven enough for this old sinner saved by grace. When we see him, we will be forever be reminded of the awful price he paid for us at Calvary. Amen? Amen. Then I saw the lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures and the elders. And the lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the earth. He is still a lamb as it had been slain, and forever in his body he will bear the marks of his love for us that will never go away. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, 
and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Heaven will be wonderful, church, because we get to see Jesus, what we deserved. The Easter angel preached a powerful message. Don't you think? I am personally convinced that this is the most important message ever delivered by an angel in humanity. So let's just praise the Lord this morning that we know Jesus in a personal way and that we are saved and you know. He is still saving souls today, church. He is still blessing hearts today. He is still filling his servants today. How can this be? Because he lives, the song says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because what the angel said is still true. He is risen. He is not here. To say, I say, glory to God. Amen. Let's stand this morning. Let's stand this morning. And Brian, if you can sing that song one more time. For God so loved. We'll leave.